Welcome to the Zelda Informer Podcast. I am your host, Alfred Tabax, joined once again by my beautiful co-host, Andy Spatiri. Hello, everybody. Today we have a very, very special guest with us. Uh, instead of introducing him, I'll, I'll let him speak for himself because uh, that's what he does for a living. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Spatiri. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Hi, <laughs> everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Chiplock. Uh, some of you may know me online as Sonic Mega. And for the past decade or so, I have been a voice actor. And for a better part of a decade, I've been a professional voice actor. <laughs> doing stuff ranging from online business narrations to video games to anime. I uh, haven't done a whole lot of Western cartoons, but I'm certainly doing my best to get better at it. And uh, yeah. So uh, what are some of the things that you've done, just, just in case people don't uh, know who you are? Well, I was in this little thing called The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild as yeah, the voices what? of Rivali, Teba, and the Deku Tree. It's kind of like a niche series from Nintendo. <laughs> I don't know if a lot of people have played it. Yeah, it's kind of like um, Metroid. Small little game that just came out. Yeah, yeah. I, Metroid's definitely way bigger. They've had games coming out <laughs> for that for like the last five years in a row. Uh, um, that's a sore spot on this podcast. <laughs> let's, let's not go there. Um, there's also uh, Kyotake Shimaru and Danganronpa. Um, there's, oh, I'm trying to think of the stuff that I can actually talk about. Uh, <laughs> Fire Emblem Echoes came out recently, and I voiced uh, Jerome, Wolf, Blake, and Halcyon. Um, uh, Kasim and Magi Labyrinth of Magic, Rash the Battletoad, and Killer Instinct. Um, God, I'm trying to remember the more recent stuff. Give me like five seconds, real quick. Like, I always freaking forget. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, uh, Yuki Mishima, Mishima Yuki in Persona 5. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my most recent exposure to that because I just finished playing that game. I loved him, man. Moon Moe is the best. So, for, for people trying to listen for your, to your voice and, and pick out those two voices, um, it's a little difficult because you don't exactly sound 100% like them. So, could you give us examples of them? <sighs> oh, man. Yeah, do the voice. I love when people ask this. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Ravali is definitely one of the most challenging, but one of my personal favorites. He's not much different from my normal voice. He's just very full of himself, extremely confident, and has an air of arrogance about him. The Deku tree involves being very calm and wise. I am actually not able to do this voice unless my body is completely relaxed. Um, for Teba, he's interesting because I, I'll have to spin off briefly to go to Bedfellows. You already heard Fatigue, who's a very jolly and gay British, uh, African individual, jackalope. And then there's, like, Sheen, who's just always angry all the time. But if you just kind of deepen Sheen a little bit and you make him, like, more just gruff instead of pissed off at the world. So if you take his voice and you just make him, like, a little bit more confident, you get Teba. Um, and Teba was really, I had to like tense up my whole body to do Teba in the studio. So it's one of those cases where you really just have to be in the zone. <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, Yuki Mishima, he's just, you know, when I'm just being really young and kind of myself, he's uh, insecure, but he's super supportive. So he's energetic and youthful in his voice. And there you yeah. go. <laughs> there you go. That was unreal. There's the master at work right there. Uh, oh, but my personal favorite is whoever that one frog lady is from Rocco. Oh, Rocco, <laughs> you should get my chimneys jiggling. <laughs> so there you go. In case you didn't know who he was, now you know. <laughs> so uh, how did how did you decide to get into voice acting work? Like, what what makes you decide? Like, this is what I want to do. Do you want the short version or the long version? We've got time. Oh, go give for us the it. long version. Okay. Well. <laughs> the time of night changes every time, but hopefully I'll remember this. I think it was December 29th of 2006. It was about 3.13 in the morning. And I know this because they Toonami had just started doing their, their second cycle of the shows for the evening. And I'm pretty sure it was at 3 a.m. that it reset. It was always 12 to 3 and then 3 to 6. 
And so they were re-showing, I think, Full Metal Alchemist at the time. And I was staying up doing my daily stuff on Neopets because it had reset <laughs> for the day. And I had gotten sick and tired of Adult Swim advertising their website every other commercial throughout the entire evening. So at one point I went, okay, fine. I'll check out this website. We'll see if it's any good. So um, I went ahead and went to the Adult Swim website. And you guys remember like those old MTV behind the music video things that they would show where yeah. it would be like a music video, but then these little factoid bubbles would pop up with like behind the scenes information. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they had that for like an upcoming episode of Trinity Blood. And one of the little blurbs, if you clicked it, opened up a video of Troy Baker in the studio doing recording a recording session for Abel Night Road. And so I, I watched this and I'm watching this guy, this this Troy Baker person. He's kind of <laughs> a little more prolific nowadays, I think. Um, it, just standing in a booth and on another screen is the anime, the, the, the Abel Night Road, like having a conversation with someone and they're doing the beeps and he starts talking. And I realized that they're not like chain. He's not really adjusting his voice very much. They're not adding special effects at the same time. He's just talking. But at the same time he's talking, this character on screen is moving their lips. And I realize, wait, he's the character. His, his, his voice It's the character's voice. What is this? And like even before then, like my brother and I would had already kind of been doing voiceover. Like when we would play games like Bomberman 64, the second attack, we would like come up with voices and like read the lines of the boss characters that were speaking. But that was the first time that it had really clicked in my head that voiceover was a thing that people did. Now, at the time, what what made it click was, oh, my God, I can be loud and obnoxious and hyper energy and people will pay me for it. <laughs> Sign me the fuck up. <laughs> um, but nowadays, it's more cool because it's like I can have adventures and do these things that would be impossible in real life. Like, you know, I can cast spells or I can do cool sword tricks or I can get myself disemboweled and actually be able to eat curry house later today. So, yeah, I I just got really, really into it. And it was the first time something in my life had just sparked a, an interest in me that I that I legitimately wanted to pursue it further and see what more there was to it. So I clung to it for dear life. Um, and that's just kind of how it started. From there, I just, I've had moments where I was like, do I even know what the hell I'm doing? But I've never been able to truly let go a voiceover. And at this point, it is it is a major, major part of my identity. So... Um, yeah, that's pretty I feel much like if how you it's don't have be. those moments where you're like, what am I doing? Like, are you really doing something worthwhile then? Or am I making any significant progress? Or like just those moments when you hit those milestones where it's like, all right, now I'm in a whole different ball field. But now that I'm at this league, do I actually have what it takes to play at this league? And every time I just whether or not I believed I could, I just stuck with it. And either through experience or confidence or hard life lessons I learned and overcame. So voiceover is me, dude. That's, that's who I am now. So what was the so first, kinda, oh, go ahead. Andy. Yeah. Piggyback enough that, uh, like what was your, what was your first big moment where you're, where like your first big break where you're like, this is the big oh, leagues. Man. Like, you so, know, it's time to do on, this, adjust, uh, uh, do this for real thing real quick. Make sure it's not too high. Okay, cool. Cool. So, uh, you said, what was my, my first big moment? Well, I've had a lot of different milestones. Yeah. So the first really big moment that like made me realize I can do this for, I can do this, I can actually do this was because when I first um, got into voiceover, I made a post on Newgrounds. This was literally 10 years ago. I made a post on Newgrounds that said, guys, I know what I want to <laughs> do in life. I want to be an anime voice actor. And it wasn't, it wasn't even like a major goal. I, I, I actually checked out the <laughs> post the other day and it wasn't even anything significant like, I want to be a lead role in an anime. It was just, I want a voice in an anime in any capacity. So the first milestone leading up to that was when <laughs> I did the Anime Expo AX Idol competition in 2009, which was significant for a couple of reasons. The first was because it was my first convention ever. That's right, my first ever convention, and I went to Anime Expo. It was a learning experience. Um, 
But um, additionally, because it was the first time I'd really gone into any sort of competitive venture. It was the first time I'd really gone out of my hometown of Michigan and gone to a completely different state to, to experience this convention with some people that I knew who lived out there, uh, including folks who I knew from a website called The Voice Acting Club who had been living out there for a couple of years. It was just cool to like actually meet up with them and take part in this together. Um, but it was so weird it's just kind of like one of those things that some people just see as egotistical and other people see as like, wow, that's really neat. But um, it was the first year I competed for that and I ended up winning the voice acting competition. And not only was I the youngest person at that point to have won the competition since they started, I think, in 2003, but I was also the first male to win the voiceover competition since they had started. So... I know, I know. It was like really, really cool. And wow, it was really? just a really important moment, like saying, you know, you've got, there's the audience for this. You've got the drive and the energy to make it work. Even if, you know, maybe I was still way, way more amateur in terms of how it compares to me now. It was clear that the the opportunity was there and that I was able to seize it. Um, what's funny about that is the result of that competition kind of led me to get a little full of myself and it led to like two years of just not making real progress i was phoning stuff in i thought oh because i won this competition i know what i'm doing i'm better than my peers and it it pissed off a lot of people it, it my mentor was not happy with me so that was an that was one of those harsh life <laughs> lessons i learned about um but milestones have happened since then. So, for example, when I booked Dia Bell and Sword Art Online, even though it was for one episode, it was a role in an anime, an actual casting role, and it was an anime that aired on Toonami. So, all of a sudden, I was on a freaking TV broadcast that was big, a big, big deal. Um... I remember still, you know, getting my representation through an agency when they... I wasn't even... The agency that I'm with... Uh, primarily slash only deals with union talent, but they signed me when I was still non-union because they saw potential and they wanted to snag, uh, snag me before anyone else did. And that shows a huge amount of trust to take someone on that you can't even help out yet because you see a future for them and you don't want other companies to get them first. So I'm ex immensely grateful for that. Um, there is a huge, 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 huge milestone right now like at this moment that is coming to life for me, but I can't talk about it yet and I can't give any details about it. But this is one of those moments we're going to be like, <laughs> I, I didn't stop setting goals for myself after I achieved the ones that I had made. So if anyone is interested in seeing what I'm up to, you're going to want to follow my, we'll, we'll get to the social media accounts later on, but you'll want to follow them because it's a hell of a ride right now, but there is a lot of things coming down the pipeline. So yeah, we, we have a very your, important question for you. There's your five-minute yeah, you answer for a five-second question. The important question is, are you sure you can't tell us? <laughs> I am 100% positive I can't tell you. Duh. We had to try. Like, the project the project hasn't even been yeah, announced okay. yet. So, we, like, we if I said that. anything about it, I would be breaking so many contracts. I, <laughs> it's, I can't. I really cannot. You'd be like Tom Holland is with Marvel. Yeah. Ooh. Well, you know, except with the frogs trying to escape from my mouth. Yeah, that that. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a bit about the recording process then. Yeah. Because um, I know not everybody that listens to us is a voice recording artist. Um, so how how does that go for you typically? Um, and in in terms of I guess anime and video games, what does the localization team well, do? Well, I would say that I happen to come into the industry right around when a major shift happened in how they did things. So. At least to my knowledge, at least before uh, a couple years, maybe closer to a decade ago, a lot of auditions would happen at the studio. They would look for people who are living local and they'd have you come into the studio to record your audition. Nowadays, pretty much every single audition I do is sent in from home. Um, my agency, unless we're doing partner reads, has me submit from home. Uh, the anime and video game companies have me submit auditions from home. Um, there may be once in a blue moon, they'll have someone come in for a live audition, but I'm talking like it is the exception to the rule at this point. And there's benefits and, and other things to it. The benefit is that I don't have to drive out in traffic in order to go to an audition. Um, I can prepare and just record whenever it feels good for me. 
Um, the downside being that it does involve a sense of self-direction. And I know people who are, I don't know what I identify as, but I know people who are both incredible at directing themselves, um, but just, I don't know. But there are also people who are great, great, great actors um, who, when they're paired with great directors, but when it comes to directing themselves, they are are not good at all like they second guess themselves i probably identify that is because i'm always wondering like could that shout be cleaner should i be emphasizing this word um because i was raised on a lot of of campy video games and a lot of exaggerated cartoons my style tends to typically be exaggerated one of the major weaknesses i've had that i've been working on is just sounding real and authentic and not being uh exaggerated all the time so um yeah, pretty much. It's all done from home. Uh, the actual recording, if booked, will happen at the studio because they want everyone at the same recording quality under the same conditions. It's a consistency thing. Uh, but that's pretty much how it goes. Yeah. So what is the localization team? Like, how much say do they have in how you voice or what, um, I guess, the what script rewriting? Like, you mean, like, how much influence do I have over the script rewriting? Or, or how much? How much, like, do you work with the localization team? in doing this like uh oh, geez like okay so this is an anticlimactic answer but unless you're like really chum buddies with the studio and like they are open to opinions in the first place my job begins and ends as a voiceover artist so <laughs> when i come in the localization usually voiceover is one of the last things that happens on a project because by the time you're coming in the localization team is already translated they've edited the script uh if it has to match time flaps they've already edited the script to precisely match the time flaps for down to the number of syllables or how long it takes um, and so when I come in, most of the time, the, what's in front of me is what I need to read. And they'll tell me whether it needs to be, you know, on uh, a timestamp or not. Um, there is a project I'm working on where the director is totally open to adjusting the script as needed. Um, but we've also worked together on a number of projects before. And there is a mutual understanding that I'm free to throw ideas out there, but he's also completely free to ignore them. So it is not the norm. And I would not recommend people just be like, hey, can I say this instead? Because they hired people to write and edit these scripts. If you try and do their job for them, you're going to just annoy them. Um, but yeah, that's essentially it. So like people have asked about, oh, well, in Breath of the Wild, you know, in all the other versions, Rivali laughs. But in the English version, you have a line that you say. Is that something that you changed? And like, nope. I just came in and I read the words on the script and I did it in a way that didn't suck and I got paid. <laughs> End of job. So what was uh, like? What was your impression of working on like like you knew that Breath of the Wild was obviously going to be a huge blockbuster game. Like, tell us a little bit about uh, the recording process for Breath of the Wild specifically. Um, well, a lot of people would think that, like, uh, oh my god, when you got the notice that you were cast for Breath of the Wild, you must have been like over the moon. And my answer was yes for about five seconds and then it went into paranoia mode because <laughs> i knew for a fact that the only other game in the series with official voice acting is also officially a pile of garbage so um people would be scrutinizing any english voiceover in a zelda game harder than any other series in existence that i can think of from nintendo and so while I was super, super happy to have the roles that I did, especially for Rivali, because I, I felt in my heart that I was no one else was more devoted to this character than I was. I was also paranoid because I wanted the absolute best that these characters could be given. I did not want to give people any reason to be like, oh, great. It's another wand of Gamelon. Hooray, <laughs> Nintendo. Um, and... There were equal mixes. Like like I said, with um, with Teba, it was 100% me. Like, I knew what I wanted to do for his voice. I'm glad my th throat co uh, cooperated, but the directors loved what they heard, and we just did that. Rivali was the complete opposite. For a long time, I really, really struggled with just nailing down his specific character, and I relied a lot on the support and influence of my director. Um, but he helped get me through it, and so that's it's a good uh, piece of evidence as to how collaborative the recording process can be. Um, yeah, so that's basically my answer was I was excited, but it was very, very much contained under a professional shell because, uh, the way I look at things, it's the only time you should be celebrating is once everything is said and done. 
because uh, in regards to most roles, you can be recast. People have done it. I've had friends ha uh, have it happen to them. So don't celebrate about a role uh, or don't throw a party about a role until you've wrapped up recording and everything sounds nice and fun. Because if you put your cart before your horse and then you give a terrible phoned in performance, well, guess what? <laughs> it's out there forever. So <laughs> yeah, I, I go total professional mode once I'm booked and then I let the enjoyment seep in after it's public and I can interact with the fan base. So uh, kind of with that then, have you played Breath of the Wild in Persona 5 yet? Like uh, all the way through? Absolutely or? not. And it's different reasons <laughs> for both. The reason why I don't play Persona 5 is, although I completely agree that as a UI and a game experience, it's a wonderful game, um, I'm just not really keen on the mechanics of Persona 5. I mm -hmm. played Persona Q, and I thought I would enjoy it because at least there were elements of Etrian Odyssey, but I just, uh, I don't like the fusion system. I just, it's just, it's not my type of game. I'm yeah. sorry to anyone I piss off for saying that, <laughs> but it's just, it's not. I really just don't enjoy that style of game. Um, Breath of the Wild is different, um, and it's just because I don't play it because I'd never have enough time to properly play it. What I tell people is Persona 5 and Breath of the Wild are both incredibly great games for different reasons. Persona 5 is a stunning example of a game as a product, as, a, as the end result of a team's work. When you look at the artists, the user interface, the mechanics that they did, the story, how it all comes together, Persona 5 is a wonderful example of, of what a team of people can do um, together. Breath of the Wild is a perfect example of a individual user experience. Breath of the Wild is a game that you play and you will have your own adventure, your own experience. Sure, maybe you'll run into things that other people also did, but it's probably going to be at your own pace and, and your own um, sequence of events. And when you leave, when you're done, you've got your very own unique game experience that you can carry with you throughout your life. So that's why that's good. But because it's such a grand adventure... And I'm a person who doesn't like to start things unless he's ready to finish them. <laughs> I mean, it's a good problem to have being too busy to sit down and play Breath of the Wild, but I am way too busy to sit down and play Breath of the Wild. It's definitely um, a commitment to, to a play that game for sure. I think I'm at like yes, 200 prior hours. To a like, there was a game I used to play called Jade Cocoon 2 for the PlayStation 2. Have any of you heard of it? No. Okay. I restarted that game from scratch four times before I actually beat it all the way through. Twice because I lost it, once because of a game glitch, and another time because I got super, super far into it, and then I just kind of stopped playing it for a couple months, and then when I came back, I had no freaking idea <laughs> where I was in the story, or what I was supposed to be doing, or what was next to my itinerary. And just, if that happened with a game like that, I cannot let it happen with Breath of the Wild, so help me God. <laughs> so, I would like to say I'm gonna find an opportunity to play it, but realistically, it's probably just going to be a nice centerpiece above my fireplace. <laughs> so it's but, not like it's just because it's weird hearing your own voice and anything? No, no. Like, I've gotten to a point where I can enjoy my performances now instead of feeling cringy all the time. But it's <laughs> really just a case of I simply do not have the amount of time available that I would want to properly give this game. And if I can't give it, then I'm just not going to start it. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to veer into some maybe maybe some territory that you might have to shoot us down on, but can you tell us anything about the upcoming Breath of the Wild DLC, as in are there more, uh, is there more scenes where we hear Rivoli talking or anyone else speaking, or uh, are I know you finished as much officially? As everyone, I know as much as everyone else in the public knows, and anything I know beyond that, I wouldn't be allowed to talk about. That's what we figured. But I know all, all I know is that they've this is literally just as a consumer. I know that they have spilled info about people in other countries doing additional recordings. I would say based on that, there is a good chance that there would be English recordings. However, I say a good chance because I don't know what the actual plan is. And even if I did, I couldn't say anything. So I don't know. Yeah. I really don't. There it is, folks. We tried. We struck out. We're sorry. But... <laughs> Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to quote uh, a very, uh, loved and passed on member of Nintendo and say, please understand. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. our bodies were ready. I know. Yeah. Well, my, I think, uh, like I wanted to say to you, like probably one of the biggest compliments, just going back to voice work is like, I've been playing Zelda since, you know, since forever. And, you know, when I first heard the great Deku tree almost 20 years ago, when I first heard him speak in Breath of the Wild, it sounded exactly like what I thought he would. So... 
<laughs> so I mean, like that's, I find that's probably funny. like the biggest compliment that I can. They, everything it just seems so natural to hear, you know. Deku Tree definitely separates a lot of people. Like uh, there are as many people who are like, "Oh my god, he sounds exactly like what I thought." As there are people going, "Oh my god, it sounds like a twenty-two-year-old trying to sound like a sixty-year-old," which <laughs> they're not wrong. But the funny thing is that a lot of people agree that Ravali and Tebo, or at least Ravali. Excuse me, are very well done. But the funny thing is, originally, I was only booked for Deku Tree. <laughs> it was just that character. And along the process of recording, something happened where I was able to submit uh, live auditions for a different character, which was Rivali, and uh, did that. And then in the middle of doing Rivali, they said, can you do a different voice for another Rito? But had I not booked the character that people argue is one of my weakest in the game, I never would have gotten the other two. So I'm super, super grateful that that happened and that I was able to challenge my range and, and challenge people's expectations of my range because that's literally how it worked out. I wouldn't have had Rivali without Deku Tree. So... That's funny. So let's talk about uh, Rivoli for a second here. Uh, basically, yeah. everyone, myself included, thinks that Rivoli is a big jerk. So, <laughs> do you, like, do you really get into that? Like, do you relish playing a character like that, or, or does it make it a little bit harder to get into knowing that you know people <laughs> might not like this guy? Will, this probably will answer your question, but I actually had to pull back on how much of an asshole I was making Rivoli. <laughs> Because, I mean, it's my understanding that in the Japanese dub, he is more affluent or arrogant. Um, but they definitely wanted to go, I think they wanted to go for, like, a more internal confidence rather. Like, you know, like he just truly, truly believes he's great rather than he's c trying to convince everyone around him that he's great. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so that required a lot more nuance than just, you know, outlandishly saying everything that you're saying, like, oh, I'm telling the truth, believe me. So, <laughs> yes, I, I do very well with playing characters who are assholes um, because uh, I have a very dry sense of humor. I enjoy a lot of dark humor as well. I can be super sarcastic. So when I get to do stuff like in, in the Nonary games where I voiced uh, Santa, when I got to literally stare at my director who was playing a character that I was saying this quote to and say, you know, get out of the way, you fucking old bitch. <laughs> you can bleep that out if you have to. And I had to flip her off. I had to flip her off while I was looking at her through the glass so that I could really get into the role. So when you get to do that and get paid, it's like the child in me discovering voiceover all over again. Being like, <laughs> oh, I can do these things that would make people hate me and they love me for it. So it sounds like that, yeah. was, that was pretty easy of a role for you then, like in terms of getting into it. It's, uh... It was definitely, I'm definitely a bit of a method actor at times. Like, I remember once I really clicked into Rivali, I would, like, stand. Based on how he was talking, I would move my arms in a certain motion. So, like, if he was just instructing Link, like, when he's telling him what to do on Palmetto, I would, like, hold my arms behind my back, but I would treat them as though they were, like, wings. So, if I had to move them, I would do, like, very sweeping motions, like he's lifting the weight of all of his feathers. Um, and it just, uh, getting into that mindset helped me think like an arrogant asshole bird. Yeah, it helped out. <laughs> so then in terms of your character uh, in Breath of the Wild and Persona 5, so Rivali and Mishima, uh, what were the most difficult aspects of voicing those characters? Um, With Rivali was definitely just not going too ham with him. Like I said, one of my fa I, when I get to go ham, I do exceptionally, exceptionally well. Like uh, the biggest example is Zenk in Fairy Fencer F. If anyone wants to hear what happens when Sean Chiplock is just allowed to go ham bone bloodthirsty murder, um, listen to Zenk in, in Fairy Fencer F. And that is a, that was literally a case where the more intense I got, the more the director loved it. So... Um, so that was the hard part with Rivali was not going that far with Mishima. Um, so this is something that I, 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 it's not necessarily a weakness. It's just something that I'm working on improving. Um, Mishima was very much in my higher register and that's fine until I have to yell because everyone has that point where it's that, it's that point between your normal voice and your falsetto where your voice is very, very prone to cracking. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are times when I will shout as a character and it will be super, super clean. And then they'll do a second take and I'll do the same exact shout and it will sound like a pterodactyl is trying to poison itself. <laughs> um, 
So it gets frustrating if I know I'm capable of doing it and it's just not coming out. Um, and I think there were a couple times that Mishima shouted in the game that I wasn't really happy with just because there's a point where you're really putting everything into your shout. And when you're putting everything into your shout, it's pulling everything from your lungs, including whatever your natural range is. So I would be super, super intense shouting and a little bit of my baritone would be coming out because everything is coming out. Mm -hmm. um, and when it's baritone, it's not that clear, youthful sound. So that's that's definitely what the hard part. With Mishima, being just general, happy, excited him was fine, but when I had to shout or get really loud, I would get worried about if my voice was going to crack. And the problem is, the more worn out your throat gets, the more likely that it's going to crack because you simply don't have, you know, frictionless vocal cords or whatever it is. They, they've got, you know, the bumps or uh, just the general soreness. So it, you're kind of like on a timer. You have to do it right the first couple of times because if you do it over and over and over again, you're going to wear yourself out and then it's just going to all sound terrible. Yeah. So have you, uh, just kind of out of personal curiosity then, um, <clears throat> you talked about Troy Baker being one of the people that brought you in uh, just through his performance, but have you met any of those like, um, I guess, bigger figures in the voice acting community? Um... I would say if I have, it's only been in the same capacity as a typical convention fan. So like going to a, a panel that they're hosting. Okay. Um, I'm not really big on like social events. So most of the reason why I haven't run into them is just simply because I bury myself in my work. And if I'm done with my work, then I'm just relaxing at home with the fiance. Uh, I do try and study elements of them that I really like. For example, when I first started out, I told people if I could have Kari Walgren's range, Liam O'Brien's uh, uh, ability to go ham like he does with Dist the Rose in Tales of the Abyss, and Steve Bloom's intensity, or, or Steve Bloom's uh, uh, vocal gravitas, then I would never have a day without work. Um, I also recently have come to really, really admire, um, do you guys remember who voiced Goro Akechi? Was that Robbie Damon? Yeah, it was Robbie Persona? Damon. Yeah, he... Robbie Damon... Robbie Damon's screams and yells and, and angry shouts are so crisp. And that's something I would love, love, love to pick up is just the ability to have crisp, loud yelling. Uh, Middleman is also really good at mm -hmm. doing that when he plays Ryuji. When he screams Persona, it's so good and intense without his voice cracking. So I want to steal that from them next. And you guys so all I, just kind of popped up around the same time too, like... I know Robbie and uh, I think Max weren't like they weren't not big, but they I think the they first were thing booking I remember, buddies. They would always be in the same projects yeah. together. So you'd get in like Al Noah Zero and then they were in uh, One Punch Man together. And so like I just I, I hadn't heard of them until I got to Al Noah Zero. I was like, oh, man, these guys are in everything now. And I think Justin Briner is that way for Texas right now. Like he also he voices Deku in My Hero Academia. Mm -hmm. Um so he's mainly Texas focused, but he's kind of the same way over there. And yeah, the same way that uh, Johnny Young Bosch had a lot, had his period of time where he was in everything. Uh, Bryce Pappenbrook had that period of time. He may still be in that period of time. I definitely think it's that period of time right now for Max Middleman and especially Kyle McCarley. Mm -hmm. He is making major waves in the industry right now. So do you guys like, uh, I know you said you don't like, go out and hang out with them at all. Do you guys ever talk about roles and stuff between each other? I mean, not really. I'm, I'm assuming that there are inner circles of people who do it, but if there are, then I'm not part of them. I just typically prefer to keep to interacting with fans and stuff. The way I look at it, it's like my peers are either busy with work and I shouldn't bother them, or they're busy trying to land work and I shouldn't be interrupting them. So I figure my time is better spent sharing my passion and my roles and my information with those who want to support me with the fan bases or P, uh, peers who are trying to get further into the industry who specifically come to me to ask for help. Um, but outside of that, I try not to, to bug people who I would consider my peers because they got their own lives. They got their own stuff to focus on just like I do. Um, and it's just like, if I've got a role, they'll find out about it. You know, I don't need to push it down their throats like I'm a Christian vegan or something like that. <laughs> So, um, so how, like, how much video game, would you say that you're a video game fan? Do you still have time to play them, or, or dungeon mostly crawlers, what? Dungeon crawlers, dungeon crawlers, yeah. dungeon crawlers, dungeon crawlers, dungeon crawlers, Etrian Odyssey, Demon Gaze, Operation Babel, Operation Abyss, Demon Gaze 2. Uh, trying to think of what else, Mary Skelter, uh, what else, dungeon crawlers, yeah, dungeon crawlers. <laughs> <laughs> Just because um, they're quick. Or anything with pets. 
if you can have a pet companion fight alongside you, aka uh, Tales of Symphonia, Dawn of the New World, Spiral Knights, Tree of Savior, um, Maple Story, uh, Fantasy Life, uh, I'm trying to think of what else. Legend of I Zelda Breath of the Wild with your little wolf buddy. <laughs> you know what? This is the sad part. I I bought Twilight Princess HD, and I never. The only reason why I bought it was because I planned on playing it long enough to max out the health for <laughs> Wolf Link, yeah, so that I, I that could too. bring him into the game and have him as my wolf companion. I didn't care about Twilight Princess the game. I cared about Twilight Princess the Wolf Link amiibo <laughs> that you can use for Breath of the Wild. Yeah, that's exactly that's why I bought the only Twilight reason Princess I bought it. HD is for the Amiibo. The reason, I, the reason I bought Fantasy Life was not because of the gameplay or the trailer. It's because in the trailer, they show like a two-second clip where there's a black cat following you around. And then I bought it after I saw that. <laughs> so, this, is, this isn't one of the questions, but I remember this because this is one of the... I saw this pop up in my feed, which is why I contacted you. So, you had like <clears throat> someone try to commission you for something that didn't fully understand voice work um on uh, twitter okay. i think what what was do you do you get stuff like that a lot where people you oh, know just oh okay you're talking about the the client that was like way off base with or yeah, the, did not want you to what like I was... sing and stuff like that and uh, whatever it was it doesn't happen often and i definitely do not want to stereotype anyone but there is definitely a demographic of people clients freelance clients who go on to certain websites and that website was definitely one of them which is why i wasn't the least bit surprised and their main goal is to get someone who's relatively inexperienced or who doesn't understand their value so that they can get cheap work and the, and the reason why it works is because in a lot of foreign countries most people don't know if an english accent or an english acting is bad they just hear that it's an english voice there are a lot of I've, I've had clients tell me that there are products in their countries where if you advertise it with their native language, you can sell it for X price. But if you advertise it with an English voice, primarily, and I'm just repeating the description they gave me, a uh, standard American white male executive accent, you can sell that exact same product for three to four times more because the English accent is somehow supposed to imply that the product is a luxury good. Um mm. Mm. So they don't necessarily need a perfect English voice. They just need an English voice. And so that can cause problems where you don't know if they're just literally, if they don't know better or if they are trying to take advantage of the fact that some people uh, undervalue themselves. I did at one point. I used to do jobs of, of sizable lengths for uh, 50, 60 bucks instead of 500. Um, but yeah, so I wasn't bothered that the client, you know, clearly didn't know what they were doing. I just found it amusing and I was like, oh, well, this is a perfect example of what some people will deal with. I personally don't have to deal with it anymore because I have an established, like, uh, I, I want to say a digital Rolodex of clients who come back to me. But if, for someone who's like just starting out and who's getting into the freelancing realm, it is very, very much something that they will deal with as they uh, set out to establish their prices expand their portfolio and convince clients especially that they are worth the price price that they are asking for mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay so i was just interested in that as a you know I, we're not voice actors so i just kind of wanted an insight into your world there yeah um so this is again personal curiosity i'm also uh, a bunch of people asked me about this when they heard that i was going to be talking to you so uh think they just announced like maybe last week that Persona 5 Dancing Star Night and a Persona 5 anime are coming out. Can you say anything about whether or not you're going to be in that or is that another um, again, talk? I know I know as much as the public does and usually if I am informed that I'm going to be voicing in a game, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Okay. Like the email's NDA, everything is NDA. So what I tell people, I mean, I have more to this to answer to this question, but I'm going to start off with this. A very, very safe bet is that if I haven't talked about something already on my social media, it's because I can't. And I tell people all the time, outside of uh, when an article gets posted that I see is proof that I'm allowed to talk about my involvement, my social media feed is the most updated and reliable source of any new roles that I'm allowed to talk about. So if you want to know what I'm able to talk about, follow those feeds. Because the moment I'm allowed to say anything, you can bet your bottom, do or your bottom that I will. Um... Uh, but to continue on from that, uh, I even though I'm hoping that they do an English dub, or more specifically for Dancing Star Night, that Mishima has an involvement in the game and gets to break it down, <laughs> I'm not 
automatically assuming that if they dub it, that it's going to be the same people. Perfect example being uh, Danganronpa had a game and an anime, but Funimation yeah. got the rights to the anime and they obviously used all their local talent. So the game cast and the anime cast are completely separate except for Bryce Pappenbrook and a lot of people were upset about that, fans mm -hmm. and cast members alike. Um, additionally, I know people are excited for uh, Trails of Cold Steel 3, but there's been rumors going around about, well, is Exceed going to get it or is someone else going to get it like NIS America? Because NIS got East, uh, East 8, which previously was, I think, consistently an Exceed Falcom thing. Um, so even if they do decide to dub it, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be brought back to voice the character. So I'm just with everybody else. I'm going, A... I hope Mishima's involved, and B, if he is, I sure hope people like me enough in the studio <laughs> to want me to come back to voice him again. So you also mentioned uh, Funimation, and they're primarily based out of Texas because I know that they pull from SMU um, for, for voice acting. Do you, is there like any, not competition, but do you find it difficult to compete in that kind of a market where they have a specific local pool that they pull from? Um, generally I won't even get auditions from them because they don't, uh, are going to just do from their local pool. And also because if they book someone who's out of Texas, you got to figure out, am I paying for my own plane flight out there? Do they have to pay for it because they booked me and are expecting me to come to their studio? You can make the case for that. So most of the time there's already a plethora of actors in Texas. They're just going to focus on Texas actors. However, there can be crossover if they're okay with recording remotely. For example, Texas is also home to Ocratron, who are the people who do Smite and Paladins and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I have recorded for Ocratron on multiple occasions out of an LA-based studio, even though they operate in Texas. So there is the potential to do stuff for people in other states. It's easy to have representation from agencies in different states, but that's highly dependent on A, if they're okay with you recording from home, or more importantly, B, if they're okay with outsourcing sourcing the official booked session to a studio that is not their own okay hmm. okay so the answer is yes there is a much higher barrier to doing that but it's not necessarily because of the local talent it's because of the distance we we can't we've already asked about future projects right. um and you said that you'll let us you'll let uh, your twitter feed know your social media know when, whenever you hear about them or whenever you can talk about them um but what has been one of your favorite projects to work on so far Good question. Um, I don't know. It's hard to answer because most of the time the real answer to that is it's something I can't talk about <laughs> right now. And that's usually because I'm almost always working on a project that's either challenging me in a new way or is allowing me to step into the shoes of a role either in scope or in character type that I've really, really wanted to try for a long period of time. And that, that's true right now. There is a project I can't talk about um, that is a very, very, very big deal for me. And it pains me that I can't talk about it. But I am so excited for when I finally will be able to. And I'm sorry to be vague okay. like that, but that's all I can say. Um, out of what I have done... Um, I would say, again, Zenk will always hold a special place in my heart just because, um, uh, again, there's my answer is pretty much every role <laughs> that I've done. Um, but some of them are particularly special for very specific reasons. Zenk was special because it was when I was really just allowed to go all freaking out and have a blast and everyone in, in the studio enjoyed it. Um, Teba was the very first time that I said, I know what this character sounds like in my brain. And I did it and everyone else in the room was like, yep. We agree. Go forward. So that was Teba is is me. He is he is a, a character of my heart. He is a labor of love, and he's something that belongs essentially to me. Even though Nintendo still has the copyright. <laughs> um, so um, Santa was fun because uh, he, I got to be a particularly uh, egregious butt munch. Um, I'm trying to keep it at least PG seventeen. Um, other roles, um, Rash was a fun example because, uh, his audition, there was a funny story that I tell, cause I'm not, I'm not really funny when it comes to bloopers. Like I can't be as creative as people like Crispin Freeman, but when they needed me to record as part of the session to just, uh, ad lib like air guitar stuff or like a, just ad lib a song to the, the pause menu theme from the original game for one of his taunts, 
Um, I started doing a whole freaking air guitar, air percussion thing in the studio for like a solid minute. It just kept <laughs> building and building. It was like a personal DJ rap session. And when I was done, I was like, is that enough? Do you need another take? And the director goes, we actually had what we needed after the first 10 seconds, but you were so into it. We just wanted to see how long you'd go on for. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, there was a case where I booked a role because uh I booked a role because I went off the script where I was able to add it. I did all the lines that were in the thing, but because the character was kind of very effeminate and very sassy, um, I ended, you basic bitch, at one of the ends of the lines. Um, but I did it in that character's voice. And the director said, like, you know, it was it was solid, um, and we probably would have booked you anyway, but it was the fact that you said that, and it was so in character, it was just, it, it stuck with us. And so that's one of those cases where people are like, find ways to make the audition your own without going too far off base. And I appreciated that going with my instincts, going with my gut and, and doing something creatively challenging actually assisted me in booking a role. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's better to just kind of go with what you feel like you want to do, feel like you can do. Then it's to definitely it. Richard Horvitz, especially will say that a lot. It's when you look at this character, don't focus on what the specs say they want to hear. You can provide a take of that if you want, but also look at this character and think about when you think of this character, what voice comes out of your mind and do that because that's that boils down to how you would play this character. And if you are booked based on how you would play a character, then you're going to know what you're doing and you're going to have a good time. If you book based on doing what you think they want to hear, you're going to struggle the whole time. Well, it's also something you'd be proud of too because it's, it's your character. It's something you poured your heart into. Just like yep. Teba. Just like Teba. So I think that's, that's all that I have. Andy, you got any more? <laughs> No, I, yeah, that was a. Uh, it's kind of cool to get like that inside look to, to how it's all done. Because like when I think of it, I always think of like those DC animated movies where you see everyone kind of hunched around and doing voices. So it's good to talk to an actual professional. Oh yeah, to give well, us some... I mean, I've bas I've basically done every sector, of, uh, of most of the sectors of the industry except Western animation. Yeah. And Western animation is when uh, is one of those only cases when the recording happens before the animation. So they want everyone in the room together so they can play off each other. I assume in Japan, when they do uh, their anime recordings, because the anime is created there, that they'll do the recording first and then the animating later. Um, and that's why, for a lot of people, the Japanese dub always seems better matched because, well, yeah, the animators worked around the audio, not the other <laughs> way around, like with yeah. English dubs. Um, but yeah, so Western animation, or at least local animation, wherever you're living, is typically one of the only cases where everyone in the cast is going to be in the room at the same time. Um, so yeah, stuff like SpongeBob, uh, whatever Lego series they're doing now, um, Paw Patrol, anything like that, you'll have people in the room uh, recording live. Paw Patrol, oh, my nephew watches that non-stop. They're cute, mostly for the Build-A-Bear yeah. stuffed animals. Uh, no, that was all the questions that I had. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, Sean. It was, it was an honor to have you on the show. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. <sighs> thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you for no your problem. time. If people wanted to follow you and they're not um, already, how would they do that? I was just about to say, <laughs> uh, it depends on what you want to see for me. If you want just strictly business stuff, most of the time, follow me on Facebook, Sean Chiplock. Um, if you want s mostly personal thoughts with business, go to my Twitter, at Sonic Mega. If you want mostly memes and dumb mouth recordings, then follow my Tumblr, sonicmega.tumblr.com. Okay. All right. So thank you all for joining us and, and getting to listen to this amazing voice actor that decided to honor us with his presence today. So we'll, we'll see you guys next week. All right. Thanks for having me. See you me. guys.